In today's video, we're going to go over Chapter 2, Molecular Representations as presented by Klein. In this video, we'll talk about different formats for displaying molecules as well as resonance. The first method that we looked at for representing molecule is the Lewis structure. As you can see here, we have the Lewis structure for this compound, and it's fairly complex, including uh, many different atoms and lone pairs. We can compare that to the bond line structure at the bottom of the slide, where we have a much neater and more summarized version of the molecule. For the most part, we're going to be using the bond line structure to represent molecules because of how much easier it will be to draw them and how much more simple the molecular structure looks as a bond line formula. The bond line formula is going to have all of the carbons summarized as just either endpoints or turns on the, on the structure, and all of the hydrogens will be implied. One of the useful p pieces of information that are shown in the bond line formula is the hybridization of the car carbons based on their geometry. So we can see here on this left molecule, this is all sp3 carbons, so they'll all have 109.5 degree bond angles. On the second molecule, we have an alkene, and on the alkene, we have an, two sp2 hybridized carbons, which will have bond angles of 120 degrees. In the third molecule, we have an alkyne, a triple bond. These two carbons and the alkyne will be sp hybridized, and the bond angles will be 180 degrees for those two. We're also going to be looking at a variety of functional groups. A functional group is a character, characteristic group of atoms or bonds that possess a predictable chemical behavior. Specific compositions of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, for example, sulfur, will each be different functional groups. And you'll be expected to memorize and be able to identify these functional groups as we look at different molecules throughout the semester. For example, let's look at this reaction. This reaction is a reduction using hydrogen. So we have on the left an alkene, and in the presence of hydrogen and platinum, the alkene can be reduced to an alkane. So these are two different functional groups, an alkene, or a carbon-hydrogen molecule that contains a double bond, is going to be reduced. The double bond will be um, destroyed, and instead we'll, have, we'll go from sp2 hybridized to sp3 hybridized carbons. This is table 2.1 from the textbook, and it's an example of the common functional groups that we'll be looking at. Um, this is going to go in conjunction well with the IR lab that you should be working on either this week or next week. Um, and in the IR lab, we're going to look at how these different functional groups can be distinguished based on the infrared spectrum of the molecule. I would also suggest making flashcards for each of these functional groups so that you can easily memorize them. We have an alkyne, which is a carbon-carbon triple bond. An alcohol is a single OH carbon bond. An ether is an oxygen that's making two oxygen single carbon bonds. A thiol is going to be a analogous to the, ox to the alcohol, except it has a sulfur instead of the oxygen. The sulfur is directly below oxygen on the periodic table, so it's going to have very similar bonding properties to the oxygen. And you can see di the sulfide, diethyl sulfide, looks very similar to diethyl ether, and the su sulfur has similar characteristics to the oxygen. An aromatic ring is a six carbon ring that has three double bonds. We have different carbonyl groups. A carbonyl group is a carbon-oxygen double bond. And what's on either side of the carbon-oxygen double bond will distinguish these different functional groups from each other. So a carboxylic acid has a carbon, 
that's making three bonds to oxygen. It's making one pi bond and two sigma bonds to two different oxygens. And it has an OH group. So that's where we get the acid from, carboxylic acid. An acyl halide is a carbon-oxygen double bond that instead of having an oxygen on one side, is going to have a chloride on one side. An anhydride is two carbonyl groups that are joined together by an oxygen in the middle. The ester is very similar to the anhydride and the carboxylic acid. We have a carboxylic acid, but instead of an H on this side, there's another carbon group. The amide is a nitrogen equivalent to the carboxylic acid. So we have a carbon-oxygen double bond and a carbon-nitrogen single bond. And then finally, we have an amine, which is a nitrogen that's bonded, single bonded to carbons. So these are the most common and general functional groups. And you can see in the, in the column here, we have the chapters in the textbook that where we will explore the chemistry of these different functional groups. Functional groups play an extremely important role in the reactivity and the functionality of the molecules. Just a small change in the functional group can cause very huge differences in the biological impact of a molecule. For example, let's look at these three molecules. They all have very similar carbon backbone structures and there's only small changes to the functional groups that lead to very different reactivities. So morphine has two hydroxyl groups. If we replace one of the hydroxyl groups with an ether group, so we go from an alcohol to an ether, then we have codeine. And if we replace the alcohol and the ether with esters, then we have heroin. So, you know, morphine versus codeine versus heroin all have very different therapeutic properties. And it's just small changes in these functional groups which lead to a vast difference in these properties. So just a little bit of review from chapter one. Um, we'll have different formal charges based on what's attached to a molecule. And when we're looking at bond line structure, we're gonna have to do a lot of um, Im implied analysis of the atoms. So. In the top left here, we have a carbon that's making three bonds to carbon, and it has a carbocation. So we can imply that there's no hydrogens attached to this carbon because the positive charge indicates that it does not have a filled octet. Instead, it's only going to have six electrons, uh, and those are all found in the single bonds. Here we have a carbon, carbocation, that's only making two bonds. And so we'll assume that we have one hydrogen attached here because we're also not going to have, we're only going to have six electrons around this carbon because it doesn't have a full octet indicated by the, the positive charge. And then finally, we have a terminal carbon. So it's at the end of the molecule as a carbocation. This would be a primary carbocation. This would be considered a secondary carbocation because it's making two bonds to carbon. This would be a tertiary carbocation. So the primary carbocation we can assume is going to have two hydrogens attached to the carbon atom. And then finally, we have a carbanion, which is a carbon with an extra valence electron. And this is found in the lone pair. And we can compare these to the group that the atoms are in. So these are all carbon, which is group four. And so um, when we have five electrons, directly on the carbon, that's when we get the negative charge. So you can take some time, and this will be on the worksheet as well, to identify the formal charge on any of these atoms. So when we're drawing out bond line structure, we have to assume the presence of hydrogens based on the information that is um, given in the molecule. And we're also going to have to assume or identify the number of lone pairs. We don't always necessarily have to draw out the lone pairs, but based on the charge and what is a, what the atom is directly bonded to, we should be able to assume how many lone pairs are implied. 
So for example, for the ethoxide anion, O minus, we can draw it like this without including any of the lone pairs. But if you were asked to identify or include the number of lone pairs, you should come up with six total electrons or three lone pairs around the oxygen. Because oxygen is in the sixth group of the periodic table, it needs six valence electrons to be neutral. In this case, we have one valence electron that comes from this bond, and the oxygen anion is going to have a total of seven. So we must have six unshared electrons to achieve that electron count of seven. And from this, we can come up with bonding patterns. These bonding patterns are going to be similar to the table that was presented in chapter one, uh, but it's a different way of visualizing. So if oxygen is negative, if it's anionic, it's going to have seven valence electrons because it's group six. So we're going to add one extra electron to get it negative. And so an example of that here, we have an oxygen making a single bond, and that oxygen is going to have one bond plus three lone pairs to get to its seven. If we have a neutral oxygen, it's going to have six valence electrons because it's group six. If there's no charge on the oxygen, then it's going to have two bonds and two lone pairs. That will give us a total of six valence electrons, four from the lone pairs and two from the bonds. Ethanol would be an example of this. We have this oxygen bonded to a hydrogen and bonded to a carbon, and it's implied that we have two lone pairs. A positively charged oxygen is going to have one less electron than its valence, and that will therefore have three bonds, each donating one electron to the valence and one lone pair donating two. So that gives it a total of five valence electrons, and so we can see here this protonated alcohol, or an alcohol making one extra oxygen-hydrogen bond, is going to have three bonds and one lone pair. We can do a similar exercise with nitrogen. Nitrogen is in group five, so negative nitrogen is going to have one extra electron, so a total of six valence electrons. Two of those will come from bonds, and two of them will come from low pairs. So we have the bond line drawn out with a negative charge, and we can see we got two. In order to fill its octet, we have two electrons coming from this carbon-nitrogen bond, and we have two electrons coming from this nitrogen-hydrogen bond. We have four total electrons from lone pairs, so that fulfills its octet, and is a total of six valence electrons, because of those eight electrons of the octet, two of them are shared one with the carbon, one with the hydrogen. Neutral nitrogen is going to have five valence electrons. These will come from three bonds and one lone pair. And positive nitrogen will have one less electron than its valence, and those come from four bonds and zero lone pairs. So here are uh, another set of molecules. You can take a moment and try to add in the lone pairs, as well as the formal charges that should be on each of these heteroatoms, on each of these oxygens or nitrogens. The, these will be some of the example representative examples from the worksheet. When we're drawing structures on the blackboard or using a drawing software or to show them on the slides, most of the time this is going to be a two-dimensional surface, right? The, the screen of your computer is a two-dimensional surface. But these molecules are all three dimensions in space. So we need a notation to be able to display how these molecules are going to be oriented in three-dimensional space. So for that, we're going to use dashed or solid wedges to show the groups going back into the paper or out of the paper. So for example, with this molecule, we have a methylene in this position, right? When it's drawn flat like this, we don't really have any of that information, whether um, the, you know, the three-dimensional orientation of these hydrogens, but we could also draw the hydrogens out in this manner. This carbon has two carbons attached to it. These are in the plane of the board, 
or in the plane of your screen. But coming towards us or jutting out of the screen, we have a hydrogen that's represented by a solid and we have a hydrogen that's represented by a dash. This hydrogen represented by a dash is actually going into the plane of the screen. And as we add more and more complexity to the molecules, you could see how we can distinguish between the orientation, the three-dimensional orientation of these different atoms using the wedges and dashes. Here we have two cyclohexane rings, and on the cyclohexane rings, each position has two, uh, two groups attached to it. So when there's nothing drawn, we have two hydrogens, and for example, here we have a hydroxyl group with the, wedged, with the dashed line, and the dashed line indicates that that hydroxyl group is actually pointed into the screen, same with the chlorine. They're going backwards. Here we have a molecule. This molecule is going to be a stereoisomer of this molecule because it's going to have a different 3D arrangement. We have the hydroxyl group going into the board, but we have the chlorine coming towards us in this case. This molecule is a bicyclic compound, so we have a carbon that's forming a ring uh, over here on the right, and it's also attached on the left and going up to a separate set of carbons that forms a different ring. So we have a couple of different ways of representing this molecule. You can kind of see it three-dimensionally here, um, but we could also flatten out this bottom ring, the five-membered ring on the bottom, and use the solid wedges to indicate these two carbons coming towards us and one carbon on top. There are a few other ways to represent molecules in three dimensions. On the left, we have the Fischer projection. In the middle, we have a Hawthorne projection. This is going to be used only for cyclic compounds, but you can see here we've flattened out the ring, and we have the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen on one side of the molecule, on one face of the molecule, the top face, and on the bottom face we have the hydrogen and the bromine. And then finally with bicyclic compounds, um, we can see that this hydrogen is on the same side as the bridge here, and the methoxy group is going to be on the bottom face of the molecule or on the other side of the bridge. So the three-dimensional shape of these molecules is going to have extremely important impact onto the biological function of the molecule. So it's important that we have an accurate understanding of these three-dimensional structures. One of the best ways to actually visualize the molecules in three-dimensional structures is to use a model kit. So I highly suggest as we go throughout the course to use a model kit and build some of these structures and be able to hold them in your hand and look at them and manipulate them. Another resource that you can use to look at the molecules in three dimension is qrchem.net. We did a small tutorial in class using qrchem.net, but um, here are a few different molecules that I suggest that you enter into qrchem.net and just compare their structures in three dimensions. So the next type of representation that we're gonna look at are resonance forms. In the top left here, we have a allylic carbocation. This carbon has a positive charge and therefore only has two hydrogens attached. That makes this carbon an sp2 hybridized carbon. The positive charge is located in an empty p orbital. The electrons from this carbon-carbon pi bond can move so that they're between this carbon, this sp2 carbon, and the p orbital to form a new resonance contributor. The carbocation, remember, is going to be a carbon that has only six electrons around it, so it has an unfilled octet, which means it's not happy, it's not stable, but because we can have a second resonance contributor for this molecule, where this carbon is going to bear some of the burden of the unfilled octet, 
we're going to have a stable uh, uh, an allocation that is resonance stabilized meaning this is going to be more stable than if we just had an ethyl group that had a positive charge on one of the carbons there are a few rules we must follow when we draw resonance contributors first the atoms must never move the sigma bonding or single bonding framework of the molecule never changes only the electrons in pi bonds or lone pairs which are all located in p orbitals can move so the single bond framework all stays the same we have the same rigid framework of the molecule but the molecules the electrons that are in the p orbitals can move throughout the molecule uh, to create new resonance contributors the overall charge of the system must be retained so if we if we have a resonance contributor that has a net positive charge all resonance contributors must have a net positive charge if, if one resonance contributor were to have a neutral charge then all resonance contributors overall must have a neutral charge and then finally number four <clears throat> very similar to number one the atoms never move and the atoms are connected together through a sigma bonding framework that must remain the same we never break a single bond we only move double bonds or triple bonds or lone pairs when we're drawing different resonance forms and these resonance forms are not different molecules they are just different ways to represent where the electrons of a molecule are and so we can summarize all the different resonance contributors into a resonance hybrid this resonance hybrid shows that the positive charge is delocalized throughout all three of these carbons uh, another way to think about it is with two different apples right if we have these two different apples if we kind of averaged out those structures we would get a hybrid you can see in the allyl cation um, we have all three of the orbitals the p orbitals they're all going to be aligned and we have two electrons that are going to be shared by all three of these p orbitals so overall we don't have enough electrons to fully to fill all of these orbitals but the two the electron density from the two electrons is shared between three atoms another example of a structure that has a resonance hybrid would be benzene so this is a aromatic ring it is a six membered ring that has three lone pair or three sig pi bonds within it and you can see we can move all of the pi bonds either clockwise or counterclockwise to obtain a new resonance contributor so here are a few more examples of different molecules that'll have resonance contributors and we'll work through some of these examples on the worksheet when we're looking at different resonance forms we always want to start with the a lone pair or a negative charge and move the electron density from a lone pair or a negative charge or I guess in some cases like this one it was the electron density of a pi bond and move it towards a more positive charge resonance is generally going to add a stabilizing effect for the molecule so the delocalized electrons are going to be more spread out and lower in energy and more stable the electrons that exist in these orbitals are going to have a greater distance that they span which is going to minimize the amount of negative interactions that are caused by repulsions instead of having a fully positive charge on just one atom so for example here if, if we had a carbocation all that charge all that positive charge would be in one atom if we have a resonance hybrid we have partial positive charge throughout the entire resonance hybrid instead of it just localized to one atom so that brings the question are all the bonds of the following molecule the same length remember in chapter one we saw that a double bond is going to be slightly shorter than a single bond 
Um, so you would expect at first glance that these bonds are all different lengths. However, for this molecule, we can draw out three different resonance contributors. We can move the electrons from this oxygen to form a new bond with the carbon oxygen and then break a carbon oxygen bond. And so that'll put now a negative charge on this oxygen. And what this gives us is a three different resonance contributors and all of them have a different carbon oxygen double bond. So all of these carbon oxygen bonds have double bond characteristics to them because they're is a resonance contributor that's going to show that as a potential structure. So all three of these bonds are going to have the exact same length. In order for us to move the electrons between different atoms for our resonance structures, we need to learn about curved arrows. In a curved arrow, in, in organic chemistry, we use the curved arrows to demonstrate the movement of electrons from one position to another. So the tail of the curved arrow here, the tail is always going to indicate where the electrons start. The head of the arrow is going to indicate where we're moving the electrons to. So for example, here, we're going to move the electrons from this carbon carbon bond to form a new bond. You can see the arrow is going direct. The arrow is not pointing to the, to the positive charge. That's important. The electron is pointing to the sigma bond between these two atoms, indicating that the electrons from this pi bond are going to form a new pi bond between these two carbons. If you have an arrow that's pointed directly to an atom, that means you're going to move those electrons to form a lone pair on that atom, and that's not the case here. But there will be some examples of that, and we'll look at them. So we have a few rules that we're going to talk about when using curved arrows. And these rules are specific to using curved arrows for resonance. Um, they parallel the rules that we talked about for resonance. So the first rule, never show a single sigma bond as being delocalized. Remember, we're never going to break the sigma bonding framework. We're never going to break, we're never going to move the atoms around and we're, we're never going to break the sigma bonds that are between the atoms. So this curved arrow, would indicate the sigma bond, the electrons that are shared between these two carbons, moving to be shared between these two carbons. However, this breaks one of our rule because now we've broken a sigma bond. So you, for resonance specifically, you're never going to show the electrons of a sigma bond breaking. It might happen. See, single bonds break in a chemical reaction, not resonance. There will be times in reactions where we do something like this, but never for resonance. And one important thing that I left out when talking about resonance is that the the appropriate format for resonance should be all of the resonance structures uh, in brackets. And then we use this arrow, this double headed arrow to sh to um, show indicate that these are resonance structures for each other. Resonance occurs only for electrons that exist in overlapping p orbitals. So those are pi bonds and lone pairs, not not sigma bonds. Rule number two, we're never going to exceed an octet for second row elements. So this is for, for primarily in this course, this is going to be boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, as well as all of the halogens. Note there are two elements that we might uh, have some structures that we use, which have that we can exceed the octet. Those will be sulfur and phosphorus. We might exceed the octet for sulfur and phosphorus, but never for boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or the other halogens. So let's look at some bad examples. Here we have a hydroxyl group, anion, hydroxyl anion. We're trying to form a new bond with the oxygen carbon. This would result in carbon making five bonds, and that's an egregious violation. Remember, carbon never makes five bonds, and we would have a we would have a uh, octet that's in excess. Same holds true with this molecule here. If we move the oxygen to form a new bond with the nitrogen, the nitrogen would have 10 electrons around it, and even with oxygen, that can occur as well. This is very similar to the first example. Instead, the hydrogens just drawn, aren't drawn out. But if we tried to make a bond here, 
we we're, we're making a bond, but we're not breaking a bond from this carbon, so we would have a filled we would have an overly filled octet. So it violates rule number two. More is not okay, but in some cases, second row elements are able to have less than a filled octet. So here we have a carbonyl group. A carbon-oxygen double bond is called a carbonyl group. The electrons from a carbonyl group can move up to the oxygen here. So we have the pi bond. The two electrons from the pi bond are now becoming a lone pair on the oxygen. This leads to an oxygen that has a negative charge and a carbon that has a positive charge. Um, this is completely acceptable. The carbon doesn't have an octet. You might be looking at it and saying, well, this molecule doesn't have a charge and this has a charge. That's true, but the overall charge of this molecule is going to be neutral. So again, that's completely acceptable. So here are some problems to work through um, that we'll do with the worksheet, but draw all the resonance structures for these molecules. OK, <clears throat> resonance and formal charge. So sometimes we might have a molecule, and this might not look like it has any resonance structures to start with, but we're going to identify a lone pair. We can see on this oxygen there's a lone pair, and we have to identify are there adjacent carbons that have sp2 um, hybridization. So this carbon has sp2 hybridization because it has a double bond. So that means it has a p orbital, right? sp2 hybridized carbons always have a p orbital. This carbon, sp3 hybridized, it has no p orbital. So the lone pair can be pushed down to form a new carbon oxygen pi bond. And while sim simultaneously, we can take this pi bond's electrons and move them over to this adjacent carbon. So we're making a bond and we're breaking a bond. And that's going to lead to a second resonance structure. Once we've created this new resonance structure, we have to go back and look at our formal charge again. We started with neutral on both. However, here now we have an oxygen that's making three bonds with one lone pair, and we know based on what we learned in chapter one and earlier in this chapter that this is going to be positive. Here we have a carbon with a lone pair on it, and we know that that must be negative. So you can see once we've drawn in the formal charge, um, we have a negative charge on this carbon and a positive on the oxygen. Throughout all of organic chemistry, there are going to be plenty of patterns. And it's important for us to focus on these patterns because they'll save us a lot of work in the long run. If you're able to memorize everything in this course, I salute you. You, that, you must have quite an impressive memory. Um, but for most people, that's not the case. And the way to be able to understand all the information is to generate it through identifying and visualizing different patterns. So we're going to go through five very common patterns or motifs that we'll see uh, in resonance. And if we see any, if you see any of these general bonding patterns, you can likely assume that you'll have some resonance structure to be able to identify. So the first, vinyl and allylic positions refer to the positions uh, on either side of a pi, bo pi bond. So here we have an alkene. The carbons directly attached to the double bond that are taking part in the double bond, they're always going to be sp2 hybridized, and they're going to be vanillic. That's the term we use to, des to describe them. One carbon over, we're going to have the allylic positions. If we have a lone pair in an allylic position, that lone pair is going to be conjugated with the alkene, meaning it's going to have a resonance structure with the alkene. We can take the lone pair on this nitrogen and create a new bond between the nitrogen and carbon, and then move the electrons from this carbon-carbon bond onto this carbon. So notice this is not allylic because we have a sp3 carbon in between. This carbon has no empty p orbital, so it's not going to be able to do any resonance. So we always want to look at a heteroatom 
You always want the first thing you want to look at when you see a header atom, what's next door? Are there any sp2 hybridized carbons next door, or is it only sp3 hybridized? This carbon has only, or this nitrogen has only sp3 carbons nearby, so the lone pair is not going to be able to engage in any resonance structure. This nitrogen is allylic because it's directly next to a sp2 hybridized carbon, and so we will have a resonance structure. When the atom with the lone pair has a negative charge, um, then we're going to delocalize as follows. So the, the electrons from the negative charge are going to start at the tail. Remember, we always go from negative to positive. The electron flow is always going to go from something that's more electron rich to something that's more electron poor. So we start with our negative and we push the electrons towards the double bond. And so we could see on our resonance form that they end up over here. Same thing occurs with this molecule. We form a new carbon-carbon pi bond. We break the carbon-nitrogen pi bond, and the electrons form a lone pair on the nitrogen. If the allylic atom is neutral, so here we have oxygen as the allylic atom, then we're going to be going. Then it's going to become positive, and the electrons are going to be moving away from the neutral oxygen. So we form a oxygen carbon double bond and then we break the carbon carbon double bond to put the, move the lone pair onto the carbon and so this molecule is neutral this molecule has a positive and negative charge in it but overall it is also neutral so we have allylic anions we had allylic with the neutral we can also have an allylic carbocation. So here, this is actually the first example we looked at, but here we have a empty orbital. We have electron deficient. So the electrons are going to move from electron rich. The alkene has filled octets on both of these carbons. It's going to move towards the electron deficient carbon that has an unfilled octet and generate a new resonance form. We can have multiple bonds that are conjugated. So if there's multiple double bonds, notice this carbocation, it's going to be in a p orbital. And then we have one, two, three, four carbons that are all sp2 hybridized. All of these carbons are partaking in a double bond. The electrons from the alkenes are in the p orbitals. And so we have five atoms that are conjugated together. We can move the electrons one bond at a time. So these electrons are going to form a new bond over here, and that moves the positive charge to the center of the molecule. We have one more alkene that can move the electrons between these two carbons and move the positive charge over to the right side of the molecule. And then we notice this is sp3, so we can't do anything further. So this allylic carbocation has a total of three resonance structures. A lone pair adjacent to a carbocation. Um, so the, in this example, we actually generated this structure using a resonance structure using a resonance in a previous slide. Um, here we're going to just go back to the carbonyl form. The lone pair is adjacent to a carbocation, so the electrons from the lone pair can collapse to form a new pi bond. On the left here, we have a neutral molecule that has one negative charge and one positive charge balancing each other out, and on the right side we have a neutral molecule. This molecule here, we have an oxygen with lone pair. It's attached to an sp3 carbon, so the electrons can't move to the sp3 carbon, but here we have a carbocation, we have an empty p orbital, so the electrons from the oxygen can form a new pi bond between the oxygen and the carbon, and that moves the positive charge from the carbon over to an oxygen. Pattern number four, a pi bond between two atoms of a different electronegativity. We can actually use the carbonyl example again for this. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so we can show those electrons that are shared between the oxygen and carbon. Moving to the more electronegative oxygen, the oxygen is going to hog those electrons. Um, these electrons are going to be unequally shared. This structure is more of an extreme version of what the carbonyl looks like. Um, the electrons are shared between the two, but the oxygen uh, sh um, isn't 
really is going to have more of the electron density than the carbon will. They will be unequally shared. And then our final resonance form, conjugated pi bonds in a ring. So each of these atoms has each of these carbons is sp2 hybridized because they all partake in making a double bond. And so we can actually move all of the electrons one bond to the to in a clockwise or counterclockwise fashion to form its resonance structure. So here is the summary of the five different patterns we went over. You'll want to practice identifying these patterns because because throughout the semester and the year we're going to learn different reactions, and these reactions are going to involve the electrons moving from negative to positive or bonds breaking and bonds forming. But in order for us to, for example, move an electron from negative to positive, we need to know the potential places in a molecule for there to be a positive charge, for there to be a negative charge. The, uh, the way a structure is originally drawn might not be the best place uh, for us to make a new bond with where, where those charges are. So we need to be able to, for every molecule we work with, draw every resonance structure because it might be one of those obscure resonance structures that we're searching for in order to get our desired reactivity. So some practice problems for you to work through. Draw out all the resonance contributor for the following molecules. This will be on the worksheet. And a few more molecules that you can kind of go over. But wait, there's more, and maybe just one more. Um, I know this is a lot of molecules, but drawing resonance, uh, trying to recognize all these patterns, the, the only way to get good at it is to practice many different examples. And so I'll, I'll summarize all of these on the, on the worksheet as well. So, when we have multiple resonance structures for a molecule, we can blend them all together or average them out in the hybrid structure. And the hybrid structure is the, the best single representation of where the electrons actually are in the molecule. S not all of the different resonance structures will contribute equally to the hybrid, so we're going to need some criteria to help us to determine what the most significant resonance form of a compound is or which of the resonance structures is the best model for where the electron density exists. So the first rule, we want to fill octets, right? We want all of our atoms to be happy and they're happy with the filled octet. Um, so we want to fill the greatest number of octets. In this example, we have a carbon with an unfilled octet. In this example, there is no atom with an unfilled octet. We want to minimize the charge, and I apologize. I think some of my charges got kind of messed up here. Here, the, in this resonance structure, we have a neutral compound. And the formal charge on every atom is neutral. If we move the electron density following these arrows, then we're going to have a positive charge on this nitrogen, and we're going to have a negative charge on this nitrogen. That's going to be a smaller contributor than this because now we've built charge, built formal charges on atoms within the molecule. And here, we can then move the electron density between the carbon nitrogen up to the nitrogen, and this is going to move the positive charge from the nitrogen to the carbon, and that's going to be even worse because now we have a um, we have a positive charge that's on a, a non-hetero atom, and that that kind of brings us to our third rule: a structure with a negative charge on the more electronegative atom will be more significant. So here we have an oxygen with a negative charge. That's great. Oxygen, super electronegative, wants to hog all that electron density. Fairly happy with a negative charge. But if we move with resonance, we can move that negative charge all the way to the carbon, and that's going to be a less significant contributor because we don't have an electronegative atom stabilizing that negative charge. And the same holds true here with the amide. We can move the neg we can move the um, positive charge in this case to a less electronegative atom. 
So the positive charge stabilized by the oxygen. If we move, if we drop the electrons from the nitrogen down, we're going to move the positive charge to a less electronegative atom, and that will be the major contributor. So here we have a oxygen with a negative charge, and there's two resonance structures. We can push that a, a negative charge all the way to the carbon with a negative charge. So overall, we're going to have a formal charge. Uh, both of these are going to have the negative charge. There is a third way that you could draw the electron movement, and that's after we already have the negative charge on the carbon, we can break this carbon-oxygen bond and push electrons up to the oxygen. This creates two negative charges and a positive charge. So overall, if we have something like that occur, that's going to be a very insignificant resonance contributor. You don't even need to, to draw that out. You want to minimize the amount of overall charge. Um, so we're only going to draw the resonance structures that show the delocalization of the origin charge. We're not going to generate two additional charges with this insignificant resonance contributor. So let's go back to the allyl cation. Remember the resonance hybrid is going to represent the pi bond of an allyl carbocation as being delocalized over three carbons. And another way that we can visualize this is showing an electron density map of where that pi bond is. And that the electron density of that pi bond is going to reside over all three in the p orbitals of all three of the atoms. This is um, the molecule that we drew out resonance structures for originally. You can see we have three resonance contributors, um, the carbon-oxygen double bond in this position, in this position, in this position. All three of these carbon-oxygen bonds are going to be equivalent. The way we can draw the resonance hybrid for this is to display the two negative charges and draw partial bonds for all of the carbon oxygens to indicate these all have partial double bond characteristics. So I've been using these terms localized and delocalized a lot throughout the, the slide. Localized electrons are, one that are, are ones that are not in resonance. They are local to that specific atom they cannot contribute to resonance. Delocalized electrons are in resonance and they can contribute to different resonance structures. Overall, delocalized electrons are going to be more stable. To be delocalized, a lone pair of electrons must be adjacent to an atom with a unhybridized p orbital. In the case of carbon, this is going to mean that it needs to be an sp2 carbon or an sp carbon, but definitely not an sp3 carbon. So if we look at this amide, this lone pair is going to be delocalized because we have a sp2 carbon here and it's directly next door. So we can move those electrons, form a new bond between the nitrogen and carbon, break a bond so that we don't have a Texas carbon. We're going to break this carbon oxygen bond and move those electrons up to the oxygen. So this lone pair is delocalized. What about this nitrogen? Well, the nitrogen also must be sp2 hybridized because these electrons have to be in a p orbital. They have to be in an adjacent, or they have to be in an unhybridized p orbital to be able to, to contribute to resonance. Let's look at this pyridine, this nitrogen containing, containing compound. This is an sp2 nitrogen as well. Can this lone pair contribute to resonance? The answer is no. We have sp2, three sp2 orbitals and one p orbital for this nitrogen. We can see that this nitrogen is already making a double bond with this carbon. That means the p orbital is already occupied. That nitrogen's p orbital is already making a bond with this carbon. So this lone pair must be in one of the sp2 orbitals. We can see a three-dimensional structure of the molecule. We have, very similar to benzene ring, we have three 
double bonds inside a ring. All three of those double bonds, the electrons are delocalized throughout these p orbitals. And since this nitrogen's p orbital is already taking part in this action, then the lone pair is going to be um, the lone pair is going to be orthogonal to the p orbital, and it'll be in an sp2 orbital. There is no way for this lone pair to overlap with these p orbitals. It's at a 90 degree angle to them. So we can't assume that a lone pair is delocalized just because it's next door to a pi bond. Here we have three different nitrogens. This nitrogen is localized because it's on an sp3 nitrogen. This nitrogen is not adjacent to an sp2 carbon, right? This is a sp2 carbon, so this is not going to be uh, able to do any resonance contribution. There's nowhere for this lone pair to go, and therefore it's in an sp3 orbital. This nitrogen is sp3 hybridized. This nitrogen is also is sp2 hybridized, but the p orbital is occupied by these two electrons. So the lone pair on this nitrogen is going to be localized since it's the p orbital is already occupied by the electrons between the carbon and the nitrogen. This nitrogen isn't making any double bonds directly but it's sp2 hybridized. And the reason that it's sp2 hybridized is because it has a delocalized lone pair. This lone pair, this nitrogen is going to follow, remember we were talking about the patterns, this is allylic nitrogen, meaning it's directly attached next to an alkene. So this a lone pair from the nitrogen can form a resonance structure where the electrons form a carbon nitrogen pi bond here and break this carbon carbon pi bond to form a carbon ion here. So the last topic that I wanted to briefly cover today is the degrees of unsaturation. We talked about this briefly in class today. Um, I don't think this is in your textbook yet, but I think it's important as far as pattern recognition goes to be able to understand this. So here we have um, two molecules that have zero degrees of unsaturation. The degrees of unsaturation are going to be the number of double bonds or rings in a molecule. We have no double bonds or rings in each of these molecules, and so their molecular formula is going to follow this pattern, CnH2n plus 2. So for every carbon, we have twice as many hydrogens plus 2. And this makes sense, right, because every carbon is making four bonds, and so uh, overall we're going to have to have only, a, there's only going to be a certain number of hydrogens that can exist. As we add in a double bond, we've we've removed some of the hydrogens from the molecule and so we're going to have the same number of carbons but we have less opportunity for hydrogens to exist we've removed we've removed two bonding sites for hydrogens so this is now going to follow the formula cnh2n and this is one degree of unsaturation if we have a triple bond or if we had two double bonds so this is uh, this really should be the number of pi bonds not double bonds the number of pi bonds or rings in a molecule we've now removed two additional bonding sites for hydrogen this carbon is only going to be making a bond to this carbon and a bond to this carbon but it shares six electrons so now we're going to use the formula CnH2n minus 2 Halogens are going to count like hydrogens, right? Hi halogens only make one bonding site. And nitrogen is trivalent, so it's going to only count for half. So nitrogen will have an odd number of hydrogens to halogens in the molecule. So for example, here the chemical formula, we have a nitrogen now. Our chemical formula is only going to have 11 hydrogens. So nitrogen really kind of messes up our nice, our nice pattern that we had before. Uh, but you can see here, we have one degree of unsaturation. The total number of hydrogens and halogens adds up to 10, just like it does here. And so what this allows us to derive is this equation. The total number of degrees of unsaturation, or the number of pi bonds and rings in a molecule, is going to equal to the number of carbons, plus 1, plus a half of the number of nitrogens. And then we start subtracting. 
minus the number one half the number of hydrogens minus one half the number of halogens x is a halogen and so from the molecular formula from the chemical formula we can use this equation to calculate out how many double bonds or how many rings are going to exist in a molecule and what this does is it gives us extra information just from the chemical formula on the structure so you can you can apply this to practice with some of the molecules that you looked at for the resonance and and you can kind of confirm do the calculation for example for this molecule the answer you should get is three right because we have two pi bonds and then we have one ring as well so you can double check for this and so i know there's a lot of problems to go through for this chapter but really um, practicing all these examples is going to play an important uh, role in building your foundation of organic chemistry for when we do reactions in the future